And I would like to introduce our next speaker to you. And since I'm speaking in English, you might gather that he's all the way from England. And um, he is a renowned communication specialist that works with major international corporations, Adidas, Etihad, Coca-Cola, H&M, and so on. And he focused on sustainability long before it was a hot topic. So actually, he had it before it was cool. But he doesn't mean it purely in an environmental sense, but also the social impact you have as a company or uh, as a government uh, organization, and the long-term relationships you develop. Please welcome the CEO of Salter Baxter of the MSL Group, Nigel Salter. Die is uh, na de pauze. Just checking that that's working. Now, I, I know that you said something about Brexit at the beginning, and um, all I have to do is apologize to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I stand here a proud European, ashamed of my nation. I'm very sorry about that. I also landed at Schiphol last night and for the first time ever looked at the two passport queues and realized that in a couple of weeks I will probably have to use the other category. Um, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, you are going to hear from two, two Britons in the next uh, hour or so. I guess probably make the most of it because we won't be able to come back soon, I suspect. But. We'll do what we can. Um, so thank you very much also for the fantastic setting that was provided then, because I think a lot of the issues that I talk about now will be really about how business is responding to that social landscape and the complexity that com communications professionals now face. I think what I, my perception is that the role that business now needs to play is very different from the one a few years ago. Our expectations of business are very different, and therefore communications, in its widest possible sense, needs to, has needed to, rethink its role and to think about a different relationship between what it provides to business and the relationship between business and all of the other different stakeholder groups. We are no longer in the analog world, tell the world what we think, I think we were talking then about dialogue. I'd say it's even wider than that. This is just huge, fragmented conversations that we need to be able to manage and help with. So I'm going to take you through a few examples today, explain what really I think what the landscape of sustainability is. And as Eva said, sustainability for Salter Baxter is the widest possible meaning. It's the long-term relationship between business and all of its different stakeholders, so not just the environmental component. Um, talk a little bit about why this relationship is changing, and then I have seven different responses to share with you that I think business is using, deploying, thinking about in terms of how it responds to the challenges that it's now confronted with. So there we go, just a very quick bit on Salter Baxter, I'll take 30 seconds. This is what we describe ourselves as doing, helping with the step up. We see there being a really significant challenge for business, for government, for all of us in terms of stepping up to what this opportunity looks like. Um, we work in a whole range of different ways. I won't dwell on this. These are the sort of services. And just so you know, companies around the world, different sectors, different issues. We work here in the Netherlands with Philips. We have worked with, we work with DSM. We work with Friesland Campina. Um, so we work pretty much everywhere, everywhere, everywhere where there is big business and where there is friction between business and society. So what is sustainability all about in terms of what our perception of? I think probably 10 years ago, and I don't think sustainability has ever become cool, actually, Eva. So, um, <laughs> um, uh, but 10 years ago, it was mainly about less harm. How does business stop doing damage? Um, my perception of this, and this is what I'll try and share with you in terms of these seven responses, is that it's so much more focused now on how business can do good for society. My, you know, we believe at Salter Baxter, business is not the problem. Business is absolutely the answer to the social problems the environmental problems, the innovation problems, if it is enabled to step up. It has to make this step to see the growth opportunities of the future lie in how business responds to immigration challenges, how business responds to uh, the need for innovation in process, how business responds to the need for different types of leadership, no longer the kind of big macho guy sitting at the top of an organization telling the, telling the organization what to do. That just does not work. 
And that's the sort of response that business is, need to think, is needing to think about. How do we do more good for society? So business we see as central to the solution, how it collaborates with the different parties to deliver benefit. Now, that might be easy to say, but then, because I'm going to be very optimistic, but start on a negative. You know, in some ways, nothing has changed. Yeah. Volkswagen was, in 2015, voted the leading sustainability motor manufacturer in the world on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. So, leading recognized index, which attributes the, the leading credentials of sustainability to the big businesses in the world, Volkswagen the leader. Three months later, it kind of doesn't work. And you know what? This is a communications problem. We created that as communications people. Having indices, having badges that tell us that things are more sustainable when they are clearly not. Volkswagen is a perfect example of the lack of credibility, the gap between substance and communication for an organization that they need to think harder about. And then we also had this. I don't know how, if the Panama Papers is a term that resonates um, in, in the Netherlands, but you know, just look at the number on the side. 214,488 companies involved in tax mitigation, tax, tax uh, seclusion around the world. You know, this is also a sustainability issue. We could probably address most of the health issues in Europe if the tax from these companies was being paid in Europe. Now, that is a business responsibility. And yet we're allowing that to happen. So that's, you know, we can say I'm going to be very optimistic from now on, but underlying this, there are still some major challenges that need to be thought about. And business has a responsibility to work on those. So on to the much more positive bit. What are the things that are changing? And I'm going to do this bit very quickly, if you don't mind, and then we'll talk about the practical business examples. What does business actually do in response to this? Now, I would hope by now that most of the world knows a little bit about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Can I just ask for a raise of hands? And there's, no, there's no trick question. This. Has everybody heard or heard roughly? It's not met? Okay. Yeah, it's actually a decent proportion. We're not doing too badly. Um, it's the UN, so not everybody gets to hear about it. Not everybody thinks it's great. But um, there is a major shift taking place that has been facilitated by the United Nations through this concept of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. These replace the Millennium Development Goals, which were focused on poverty. These are all about collaboration between business, government, and private finance to tackle social challenges. And they are genuinely, and I was skeptical to start with, they are genuinely forming really quite powerful partnerships and insights into the role that business can play. And I'll come back onto this right at the end when I conclude. There are some businesses who are now moving to put their senior management's incentives and remuneration linked to delivery of the SDGs. So it's moving very fast and driving change in business. You then have a whole range of different models of thought and challenges coming through society. You have the circular economy, we'll talk about. You have COP21, um, the Paris Climate Agreement last year, all sorts of things like B corporations, shared value, lots of methodologies to help business think through how it plays a different role and creates different types of value in society. COP21 in particular is now having a proper impact Major businesses that we work with, some of those names up there, are now asking us to help them with, for example, a, a concept which is called 1.5 degree business modeling. So how do they develop a business model that is, that is compliant with and will enable them to support 1.5 degree climate outcomes? So that's a business planning exercise prompted by government activity. We as communications professionals need to then enable the, those businesses to tell the world about it, because it's pretty amazing if they start delivering this fast, actually. You have the circular economy. In Europe, there is a directive coming at all of us called the Circular Economy Directive, very imaginatively. Um, and it is going to drive massive change in our businesses. Um, H&M, I'm going to talk about in a minute, is looking to change its entire model to circular. In Amsterdam and in the Netherlands in particular, there is a big focus around this. I know and with government professionals and city professionals here today. Cities are aiming to become circular. Stockholm is trying to do it. Amsterdam itself is trying to do it. This is 
big innovation that requires different types of thought and collaboration from business, from government, from individuals. And capitalism as a model is being challenged. And I think this is quite interesting, not because of what's there, but the person who's talking there is Lady Rothschild, who is part of the family that sits on one of the largest pools of finance in Europe, who's now driving a program called Inclusive Capitalism, which is a different model of capitalism. It says that we need business, but we need it to do different things. We need it to deliver different outcomes. McKinsey also doing that. Their fastest growing revenue stream is in what they called sustainability and resource productivity. So this agenda. And last week, the headline of the Time, Time magazine was Save Capitalism. You know, we need business desperately, but not in the form that it currently operates. So how do we all play a part in that? And just so we know that this is serious and it does drive to economic outcomes, I just wanted to share this with you. This was the first time ever that a mainstream equity investment house, UBS, so big, said that they had made a specific decision on re-rating a company, Unilever, based on sustainability insights. So Unilever has built huge um, robustness into its supply chain. And as a result of that, and that thinking about sustainability, it is now traded at a higher premium than P&G. Now, that's a pretty significant conclusion from a mainstream investment house. So it's starting to work. So let's talk a little bit about these, the ways in which we see companies and brands uh, responding to this challenge. Um, and I think it is really important, the bit at the end there. As I said, this is not about let's get business to harm less. This is helping business to win more and do more good for society at the same time. Really importantly as well, what we see happening is that business is understanding now that sustainability, corporate responsibility, CSR, is not the thing that you do off to the side. It's how you deliver your business. It's fundamentally at the middle of it. And if businesses can innovate with this agenda in mind, they are likely to find more growth. And probably in our relatively stagnant economies, in Europe, this is going to be one of the places where new growth is going to be found through our innovation, through our technologies, through our brain power, basically. Number one, there's a very interesting change taking place, and anyone working in companies will know this concept, is that a lot of the agenda previously has been focused on how do we just make ourselves respectable as a company? Make, let's think of, I'm not, this Philips is just the name in my head, this is not a, a concrete example, but let's think, okay, let's, how do we make Philips defensible? How do we make sure we've tidied up our processes in, and, and everybody knows that we're doing the right thing? That is no longer the agenda that business and communications needs to focus on. For business to do this well, it has to think about how does the whole system work outside it, the confines of its own entity? So how do you challenge and change the system itself rather than thinking about just is my business clean, you know, do we employ the right people, have we got the right policies? That is absolute hygiene factor. That is not um, going to drive any change. Some of you may be familiar with this campaign, which is from Patagonia. Now, Patagonia are very small, but they have radically challenged the whole clothing and fashion industry. And on Black Friday, is it Black Friday or Black Monday? I never remember, actually, sorry. Black Friday, they advertise throughout the United States to say, do not buy this jacket. And they celebrate this idea of, bring us what you already own, and we will fix it. So this is a major challenge to society to say, stop buying stuff. Buy less. Fix things. Buy quality things that last better. And we as Patagonia will take things back and, and fix them, amend them for you, so they have a longer life. Now, the smart thing here, of course, is what happens straight after Black Friday is that Patagonia's sales go like that. So it's entirely compatible with what they are saying. They are using the concept of buy less to sell more. And, and, and I genuinely don't see a contradiction in that. Now, now, the interesting thing, though, is that Patagonia are tiny, really in the grand scheme of things. They're great and you know, a really interesting organization, but small is fairly easy. Imagine what H&M could do if it could change the system. And H&M, as a 
Disclosure is one of our biggest clients, and we've helped them on a lot of this program. H&M has now made a commitment to move to the concept of 100% circular, which means that no single thing in H&M's supply chain will go to waste. Now, if you just think about how big H&M is, that is absolutely enormous as a challenge. They are bigger than, in terms of GDP than some small countries. Now, that is an enormous change. So Patagonia may do something, but it doesn't change anything. H&M does something, it changes the system. It genuinely, radically reinvents. And that's a business that's thinking about its role in society and thinking outside of its own parameters. It's thinking, how do we play a leading role to change what business does in this? Because we have a responsibility here. Um, the second bit, and this is the only video I'm going to show, it's very quick, it just gives me a pause to have a drink of water, is the concept of purpose. Now, I think a lot of organizations, actually be they cities, be they uh, communications agencies, we have thought about this concept, um, be they companies, have started to think about what is their role in society and how do you express it? And it's not the brand, it's this idea of purpose. What's, what do we deliver to society that is useful? And I'd ask you just to watch this quickly and have a think about it. It's one of the most powerful examples of a brand that has thought about not how do we sell stuff, but how do we get consumers to engage with why we exist as an organization. And it works. You do my choice. And now I will question myself. We had an option of two pathways to walk, and they led to two doorways. It was a bit confronting, actually, to be honest. So it seems to be signs of the young people to choose and be self conscious of how you perceive yourself and perhaps if it aligns up with how much the world perceives you. I went to the Apple store. Really?
<laughs> it's good, isn't it? Um, I wonder if anybody was thinking what brand it was. Had you spotted which one it was before? Had anyone seen it before or known it, I think? Okay, there's a few. You know, I've shown this to my daughter already. You know, this is what brands and business should be doing, is actually helping to tackle some of the challenges that are inherent in, in our relationship with brands and with society. And I think that's incredibly powerful. I'm sorry it's a little bit longer than probably is ideal, but I can't get that edited. We're not allowed to. Um, <clears throat> So purpose is one of those concepts that organizations, however large or small, should be thinking about and are thinking about. And it's that connection between why do we exist and how do we tell the story of why do we exist? Why is that useful to society? Dove has found a way to sell soap to make itself useful, to make it clearly aligned with a use that we can benefit from. The other thing that business and communications need to be thinking about is not just how do you address today, but how do you look at the role that we're going to be playing in future. And the best example that we have of this is one which is Coca-Cola Enterprises in Europe. Now, we facilitated a session with the CEO and a whole range of stakeholders to challenge them on what their role in society was and, and their approach. And the CEO thought he was going to be praised. You know, it's Coca-Cola, we're doing amazing things. We have the best carbon reduction in the world. We've reduced packaging by 50%. Uh, we have completely transformed the use of water in our manufacture. And all the stakeholders, bar none, said, do you know what? We don't care. You can be as good as you like at that, but you're Coca-Cola. You have to change the way that the system works. You have to think about what's the world going to look like in 25 years from now? That's what we expect of the major brands in the world. Now, we accept just about that your product's not good for us, but you know, there's a choice concept in that. But what we do expect of you is to play your role in shaping the future. So yeah, fine, cut carbon now, but what we want to see is how Coca-Cola changes what the future of business looks like. And so if you ever see any um, advertising from Coca-Cola Enterprises now, you will see that they're focused on this concept which has been created, which is delivered for today, be good, right now, that's fine, but what you have to do is inspire what tomorrow looks like. And so they are now actually recognized as having done more than any other business in terms of innovating the processes of distribution and manufacture of drinks. You know, and it may not sound that radical, but Coca-Cola are now the go-to company for any manufacturing business needing to understand about the processes of circular use of water. They now put more water back into our system then they take out, and think about that for a second, it's quite hard. They put more water back into our system than they take out, and it's because they take water from brown water, which is undrinkable and drinkable, and more, and they clean it and put it back. So they are now net positive contributor to the water systems of Europe. So it's really quite a radical change, and they've thought about this innovation role that they need to play. So it's operate today, but change the future as well. The other thing, and this is about leadership. Now, I'm going to stand here as a male CEO. The other founder of the business is female, by the way, who is also CEO, so we do have some parity there. But one of the things about leadership is that it has never been good at talking about weaknesses or things that you don't know how to solve. Um, and this is now required of business because some of the challenges that we're needing to address, be it circular Amsterdam or be it you know, uh, Philips needing to innovate completely new systems for lighting. They're not things we necessarily know how to solve. And leaders, in order to take us to that place, need to talk about the things they don't know. And it's very interesting, PepsiCo now, globally, have a campaign which is not how good we are, it's how will we. They're asking the question of how are we going to shape and solve some of these big challenges. And Unilever, some of you may be familiar with the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, is actually built around three challenges that are pretty much unattainable. And it's because the leader, Paul Polman, has been really, really powerfully positioning himself as one of those new leaders who's willing to say, we don't know this stuff, but unless we tackle this, we will not be successful. And so it requires a different model and a different relationship between leaders and business. We need to talk about the weaknesses, to collaborate, to bring other people into the dialogue 
that was mentioned. And that's the essential part. This is not tell the world. This is bring others in and solve it together because this stuff is bigger than us. There's no doubt about it. Number five, it's not actually about sustainability anymore. And this is where it gets exciting for me, is that we see business innovating everywhere. This was at Copenhagen Fashion Week. It's actually not really about sustainability. It's about responsible innovation. New revenue streams from looking through a responsibility or sustainability lens. Kering, who are the owners of Gucci, Puma, have just created an amazing concept, which is the Materials Sustainability Institute, where they're researching new production facilities, new processes that will give them the leather of the future. You know, lab-created leather is coming from this place in Italy. And one of your own brands, G-Star, if you've seen, is one of the fastest growing products in their portfolio, is raw for the oceans, made from the plastic that gathers in the ocean. So take the ocean plastic back, recycle it, we process it, turn it into denim. Most successful product they've launched, I think, in 10 years. That's the type of process that we need to be looking at and the excitement of it. And just to make sure this is not about brands, Goldman Sachs, surprisingly, are now regarded as one of the most advanced thinkers in the role that finance can play in driving innovation in sustainability. So they may be one of the evil guys in the world, but they happen to be incredibly smart and they know that this is where the future opportunities are. Number six, discomfort. This is the difficult stuff. We as communications professionals need to play a role in this and business needs to think about it. You know, in most products that we're consuming, chemicals are one of the most significant components. Unless we start to engage consumers and get them to understand what's going on, uh, there is going to be a real fundamental problem there. Now this is the case of Johnson & Johnson baby lotion and baby powder, and most of their products, in fact, all, chem all most cosmetic products have formaldehyde in them. Mother looks at formaldehyde on the label of the ingredients, doesn't want it. Um, how do we actually explain to consumers that science is actually really quite powerful and it helps this stuff, it makes it better, and yet we as consumers don't want it? GM Foods is a perfect example in Europe where one of the main probable solutions to our future sustainable food production, and yet we don't like it, and, you know, and yet science proves it's safe. How do we battle those things? These are the difficult bits that we are going to need to work with. Lego needs to find a new material to replace the plastic because it can't continue to do that in future. How is it going to do that? These are difficult problems that business is going to need us as professionals to help think through. They've launched a, an innovation center to address that. And there are now apps available everywhere. I don't know if you've seen them. There are some in different countries. This is Think Dirty, which is basically you go into a store, scan the barcode, it tells you what's in that um, cosmetic product, it tells you if it's got uh, sustainably sourced ingredients. So all of these are things happening that businesses are having to drive change on. And then finally, number seven, which is, you know, it's all well and good talking about it, but how do you actually drive it into organizations? And this isn't just about communications. This is about business strategy and business process that we, I think, as communications professionals, need to be part of. Um, now, Reckitt Benkiza, who are owners of these types of brands, you may know some of them. People often don't know the name of the corporate organization, but hundreds of brands wanted to set sustainability targets for their business, and yet they knew that nobody really liked sustainability. But what they knew that, they, that people in the organization like is capital for R&D. So they linked the targets for R&D to sustainability delivery. So the brands that delivered fastest against sustainability got the largest allocation of R&D capital the next year. So it drives the change in the organization. And then this last one I mentioned at the beginning. How do you start to make this actually work? Well, you need to incentivize people. And Novozymes, uh, one of the enzymes and biotech companies in Europe, has now linked 50% of the senior management's incentive programs to delivery against the sustainable development goals. And there are others we know looking at that, maybe not to that extent, but saying we, we are not viable and credible as leaders unless we deliver this type of agenda. So what does that all tell us? I'm wrapping up. You know, substance is absolutely fundamentally king now. It is not about content, actually. It's about credible, linking business process to communications. There's a new leadership required because this is stuff that we don't necessarily know about but that we need to work differently with. 
And the democratization effect is really basically about social media. You know, if business doesn't address this, social media will bust it immediately, very, very fast. We've seen loads of examples. And this idea of the long-term role, today and tomorrow, is becoming much more important for business to think about. Brands cannot just focus on how much are we selling now. They have to think about what is our role going to be. Coca-Cola will not exist in 20 years unless it thinks about how it plays a wider, more positive role in society. And I think it asks us, as communications professionals, what is our own purpose? Are we here just to project message? Or do we need to deliver real use to society, which is about challenging that lack of credibility, that gap, and it's about bridging the gap and helping business to step up. That's what we, as Salter Baxter, think we're here to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Salter. I have a few questions uh, from Twitter. And you can use the hashtag CDay16 and not CDay2016, so remember that. Um, it's adding to your, your conclusion. Linda van der Ven is asking, how do you prevent that the purpose, the why, doesn't become just a marketing tool? Yeah, um, it is a really important question. And I think um, there are examples of where purpose has gone too far into marketing. Um, there is a, a financial services company called Standard Chartered. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're kind of a global, but more focused on developing markets. Their purpose is a line called Here for Good. And then last year, they were one of the businesses that was exposed as having contravened the Iranian sanctions. So they're not exactly here for good. Um, so it has to be really carefully used and thought about. I think, um, I think the Dove example shows that it's a, you need to be more thoughtful. It's not just about a strap line. It has to genuinely demonstrate the, the utility and include people. Um, and I'm, there are examples where it goes a little too far, but I think generally speaking, business understands this is not strapline and just brand. This is thoughtful engagement with what we can do for society. But there are good examples where it's gone too far, so I think it's a good question. Uh, Robert Kleise asks, how does a company like Primark fit in? It seems uh, quite popular because cheap. At what point does sustainability beat price? Um, well, at the moment, price beats sustainability every day. And genuinely, that is our problem, not Primark's problem. Um, so there is, a, again, a gap to be filled, a step up that needs to be addressed there. Um, however, I think that it is worth noting Primark are making quite significant changes to uh, the manufacture process and to the factories that they're using. Um, I'm not going to defend Primark, uh, but you know, I think there is a role that we in business and, and in communications need to play, which is to try and explain that you know, it's fine and, and there, is a, you know, there is a need for access to cheaper commodities, but we don't need as much as we're buying. And also, we have to understand, and we've got to play the role here, is that there is a price paid somewhere through that chain. If it's cheap when it comes to us, it probably means there's a high price being paid somewhere else, and that's in working conditions or use of environment, environmental resources. And our role is to demonstrate that, and we're not good at that yet. I don't think society has understood what that actually means. Is that cheap? Yes, of course we need that. You know, the food industry is exactly the same. It is not right that we should get as much food for the low price that we get. It's just not good for anybody. So um, Primark are an easy one to hit, but they're not alone, actually, yeah. is all I would say. Yeah. And, and we're all to blame, actually. Yeah. So uh, you didn't hear that probably, but the former speaker, she said, I would love uh, for children already to learn the art of dialogue, but maybe this is something also to be taught yeah. from uh, here. There's a lot of people here from uh, government uh, level, so I would like to ask you, Quickly, could you translate your message also for, for people in that uh, field? Um, well, I think one of the most important things for, for government is, and this is, again, it's different from region to region, but the, the collaboration that is now needed between business and regional government is absolutely fundamental to this. There is no longer, it can no longer be seen as different parts of society and different actors. You know, circular Amsterdam will only happen as a collaboration with all of the leading businesses, the innovators in those business, businesses, plus smart planning and smart regulation and smart 
uh, governance put in place. So I think the collaboration piece is fundamentally important. The other thing is that I think government should be showing the way. You know, this, this challenge around our lack of understanding about the real price of goods at Primark, where is government in that debate? Um, I do think, though, that one of the challenges that we have is that government is almost now perceived as not having the power to drive this, but business is. So I think government needs to make sure it can play its role in this changed relationship, whereas previously we expected so much of government, I think our expectations of government have lowered, our expectations of business have increased. We somehow need to bring those back together a little bit. Well, good luck with that. Um, thank you so much, Nigel Solzer. Thank you.